Good morning, everyone. I'm Todd Hill. Uh, welcome to this year's Collective Biodiesel Conference 2013. Uh, I know that you guys are all diehards. Uh, just the drive up here was pretty tremendous, but it's a beautiful drive, that's for sure. Um, I'm happy to be back in Colorado. I'm happy that uh, uh, the conference has returned uh, to its uh, home base, we'll say. We'll call it the home state. And um, it's very cool to be here. It's very cool to see what Darwin has done. Um, great facilities, great food. Great speakers. Anyway, with that said, uh, my topic is uh, feedstock over the next 10 years. This is not a complex, high-level chemistry course that we can talk a little bit about you know, those topics, and I'm sure they'll come up. This is mostly about my ruminations and thoughts about what the future feedstocks are through maybe 2025, quite frankly, what we're really going to see versus what the hype is. Uh, I also want to talk a little bit about um, what the opportunities are in that because, quite frankly, those feedstock options require specializations. Not that you can't process them in your plants currently, but I guarantee you'll have a new piece of equipment in there if you're going to be processing more than two or three of these types of feedstocks. And so we'll talk a little bit about that um, as we go forward. So first I want to start with uh, uh, this very long statement. Now, uh, Promethean is obligated uh, to provide the an environmental protection agency uh, every couple of years with a, an engineering review. And that engineering review must include, as part of it, all the feedstocks we say we can process in our current plan, right? And it's interesting because I wanted to pull this list up, and again, you have to have this certified by a third party engineer, but this is the list of stuff that we have that we qualify for. It's a long list that includes oh, the basics from soybean oil, biogenic waste oils, fats and greases, which is uh, from us, our perspective, use cooking oil, um, algal oil, uh, non food grade corn oil, right? Um, canola, and then a series of alternative uh, <coughs> long named feedstocks, Latin named feedstocks, uh, the top of which are canolas, uh, there's mustard seeds, a variety of kinds of things that are out there, grapeseed. And most of these things, uh, from a noticing perspective, we can do via straight transit sterification. Sometimes the feedstocks require sterification uh, prior to that, uh, or they require a whole different kind of process. Um, but the reality is that of these feedstocks, quite frankly, most of us are using four or five of them at most. Right? And it's interesting because uh, to get serious traction in the industry, one of the things that we've been having as an issue is consistency of our product base. And of course, feedstock is a critical component of that. Right? Feedstock determines uh, what reaction we're doing, the life cycle of that reaction, its kinesthetics, um, the kind of processing that gets us the best results from a lower cost perspective. We'll talk about how regulatory dominance might actually influence some of the feedstocks we see in the future. But it's a long list of stuff of which 90% of it we, we don't actually process most of the time. <clears throat> so, my theory is that in the next 10 years, feedstock dominance in part will be determined by processor types and technologies. Uh, historically, most of us in this room have experience with transit sterification. Right? That's sort of ambient temperature uh, processing using alcohols, primarily methanol, and some other kind of uh, uh, hydroxide or oxide. Um, there are metal oxide catalysts. And this is becoming a more popular choice, acid via metal oxide. And I think that that's actually one of the things where it's actually been going through a new renaissance. So there were a couple of, of suppliers who actually did this. And metal oxide is a great solution. It requires higher temperatures. Generally speaking, it requires some higher pressures. Um, and it also requires you to be able to recycle your metal oxides. Uh, but there are a couple processors that are using that quite successfully. Um, Fisher tropes conversions. Okay. Uh, old hat, new hat. And I think that this is actually, quite frankly, probably going to be the dominant technology from my perspective in the next 10 years. Okay? That's going to be the big rise. Uh, for a couple of reasons we'll talk about soon. Um, and then, from the perspective of algae and other feedstocks, I really don't, don't have high hopes to see that as a fuel. Now, I know that people are doing a lot of work on that. Um, I'm sure that there might be some byproducts that get converted to fuels. But I'm thinking that that stuff gets into 
higher end products uh, from omega 3s to chain isolated solvents to long name chemical additives, in part because what I've been seeing from a lot of the research I've been reading is that some of the chain lengths that you're getting from algae are shorter, right? And sometimes that's not really good from a fuel perspective, right? We have a blend of fuel chain lengths, and that volatility is an issue for us, especially in the diesel <coughs> segment of the world. Diesel is sort of specific about its temperature, not so much for gasoline, which again, you actually might see in that sector. So different feedstocks require specialization, uh, both in people, your processing, how it's communicated, what you're doing. Right, when we run <coughs> soy virgin soy versus UCO, we're actually doing a slightly different standard operating procedure. Um, we also are looking at the life cycle. So we're built basically to sort of determine what pathway we need to take. That's a luxury that a big large scale production plant doesn't really have. And a large scale production plant, they want to see, you know, first in, first out, a very consistent approach, which is one of the things that Fisher Tropes actually offers to the world, versus our transesterification approach. Also requires, again, different equipment specializations, both for pretreatment, processing, um, internal processing. So for example, some of our UCO comes in really dirty, it's hard to see this, but this is actually a unit that we've done basically to help us process really thick greases, right? And it's really just for really thick greases. Otherwise, we have a different system that we use for thinner greases, and this is not FFA dependent. This is really just about the kind of material that we're trying to move through. Same thing here. You've got this uh, sifter, uh, this separator. And again, there are times that we're actually trying to separate things like food particles. We're trying to separate uh, uh, different kinds of uh, scaled or sized products, screen products, and that's required. There are times that we have to use different kinds of heat exchangers, right? Because at times, we're trying to cool products down. Uh, those products may coagulate or consolidate congeal in the heat exchangers. So there are some heat exchangers that we have that are quite frankly, I uh, can't probably see it here, but really big, long, almost look like these canisters, um, shell and tube heat exchangers. And then we have these flat plate exchangers that, are, that can be maintained via maintenance. We can take them apart, put them back together, service them. And then we've got flat plate heat exchangers that are never supposed to uh, be maintained that way. They're basically disposable. So they have a life cycle that we plan for <coughs> materials compatibility, and we, we chuck them at the end. Partially because in certain areas we have systems that are under high pressure, and occasionally, even though these would support that pressure, you have operator errors. And so you're trying to avoid things like accidental blowouts, accidental spills, which we all have. Accidental spills are, are a tremendous thing for us. Uh, sometimes you need different equipment to actually process and get out um, um, different uh, specific gravities in the same kind of product as well. Uh, and then sometimes uh, you need big augers. Uh, last year, as most of you are aware, we processed about a million pounds of um, recycled margarine from Palm Base. Okay? That stuff came in these 50 pound cubes. Right? They were all rock hard, solid at room temperature. In fact, they were solid at 103 degrees. So, to get that into uh, a format where we would actually have to take the emulsifiers out, take the water out, do that kind of conversion, we needed an auger and a couple of other specially designed systems just so that we could process that stuff and get it to a format where we could convert it into actual uh, fuel or whatever we were making out of it at that time. Feedstock dominance will be determined by the regulatory guidelines and market as well. One of the things that's happened, of course, is RFS, federal EPA. So this is at the uh, sort of the grand scheme of things level, right? And so I don't know, I've, I've probably heard of a renew, renewable identification number. Yeah. Okay, RINs, okay. Now we know that you know, RINs require feedstock from certain identified acceptable pathways, right? So you have a regulatory climate that actually is already helping to select certain winners and certain losers in the feedstock war. Certain things that are virgin, normally comestible food grade, may not have adequate uh, values to participate in RFS going forward. Okay? Uh, same is with LCFS, which is sort of the closest um, open carbon market. Actually, I just sold some carbon credits in the last couple of weeks. 
uh, the low carbon fuel standard actually sort of models RFS, but at the state level. And the interesting thing about it is that to uh, participate, you must have a designated fuel pathway, which means that they must understand the origination of the actual feedstock, um, the CI value, which is including its indirect land use, the transportation cost to get it there, um, uh, whether or not you are you know, clear cutting uh, Amazon rainforest or not. And it's odd because there are times when you get counterintuitive values for CI value here because in some cases it's more cost effective to ship virgin soy from a CI perspective from Iowa than it is for you to transport, say, uh, a canola from almost the same region. Uh, government and large-scale consumer and distribution chains. Now, this is really a big deal here um, because the government wants to move away from fatty acid methyl esters. Okay. The reason the um, military is driving that. The military is absolutely driving that. Do you know the reason they're driving that? They don't want to change the other components of older vehicles and older equipment. Mm, actually, that's not really the case. That's not what they're worried about right now. Most of their applications, remember, they want everything to function um, very consistently. So they're okay with multi-feedstock fuels. In fact, most of the time, in their, most of their motors, they've built multi-feedstock throughput. They can run gasoline, they can run all sorts of stuff in most of their combat vehicles and in most of their ships. They can use transmix, they can use a bunch of different things. What they don't want are some of the things that fatty acid methyl esters can do, like cold flow, cold flow. Water, they can absorb water, so they, they take on more water in their perception, right, than, than their traditional diesel or transmix or other kinds of things. And so this is actually pushing them to look at, again, Fisher Tropes. They've been certifying facilities, in fact, they're just certifying the first, uh, the first two facilities in the next couple of weeks, but they'll be Fisher Tropes facilities. They won't be transit certification facilities. Okay. Um, same thing for the ultimate, the large-scale consumer distribution chain. Right now, the economics are such that uh, blending fatty acid methyl esters into uh, conventional diesel fuel, the economics are so positive that it's being done. Right? Everybody is wondering if uh, in September, October, when people start worrying about the tax credit, if those you know, purchase orders stop, for example, and things don't go smoothly if there's a lapse in the credit, which is a possibility. Right. It comes back retroactively. It could last for an entire year again. Um, production costs, constant product availability, and subsidies. Again, very important here. Uh, the technology pick ultimately has to be able to pay for itself. Okay. What we do in the UCO is very labor intensive. That's the reality. We have a lot of labor in that product. Cleaning it up, uh, figuring out what the condition of the product is, um, all that stuff actually increases the cost. And even though we look at you know, high energy utilization <coughs> for Fisher Tropes and other kinds of things like that, to be quite frank with you all, um, ultimately, this constant product availability and production cost, with the fact that there's subsidies for certain products. So we could talk about Jotropha, for example, and we could talk about algae, for example. But if there's not a subsidy in place like there is for soy, Right. right now, we can buy soy at less than its production cost. Corn is the same way. Right? Now, goes who like to make uh, wheat grain alcohols like vodka, wheat's the same way. So, if you are not looking at the fact that the whole market right now is being driven by products that are already enjoying subsidies, farming subsidies, then it's, it seems to me very difficult to say you have a starter, even if you have a very promising tech. Because quite frankly, that tech's price point will probably need to be higher than what you can currently get from a subsidized market. Yeah. Yes. Just for quick clarification, what 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 type of feedstock are you talking about for the Fisher Trojan process? Uh, actually, I'm not talking about all of them. You can pretty much use anything in that process. Right. Right. So, so from my perspective, so it's not really. That's it's more like a process issue than a feedstock issue. Right? That's correct. That's correct, but then, again, it's a factor thing. That's what we're looking at, right? So I'm saying that, I'm predicting that Fisher Tropes might be a winner. So right? you're saying like lump everything together and get some stuff out of it kind of thing? Uh, well, that's ex well, except that, again, you have to specialize based on your feedstock, right. and you've got these subsidy issues, and you've got consistency and constancy of, of product availability, right? 
Because the whole thing is, right now, yes, you've got RINs at X number of, of dollars per relative gallon, okay? But ultimately, these, these kinds of incentives are built to get people into a market. But standard market forces will apply. So if you're seeing RINs at $1.12 today, it's quite possible, right? I doubt they'll be $1.12 in 10 years. I think they'll be more like a nickel or 10 cents in 10 years, right? Two reasons. One, we're blowing through our production numbers. We have capacity currently now. We have really more capacity. We're going to put out a number of bodies that's going to blow that number out too. As long as the, again, subsidies stay in place, the tax credits and all the things that are working uh, stay equal. Uh, but then the second thing that's even sort of more um, uh, telling is that uh, the reality is that we want to be able to move this stuff in a mass adoption approach, very similar to what's happening with ethanol. It means that we need access to pipelines, which means that the product can't have variability. It's interesting that with the ASTM D6751 standard, we basically are doing a conversion to 99.76% purity, give or take. Sometimes higher, sometimes a little bit lower. We're taking one thing, we've got to make sure that it's converted at least to 99.76% purity from a contaminant's perspective. Okay. Well, you got to think about it. That's our product. But if it goes into a line, it's being mixed with a bunch of other products. So you've got to make sure that, quite frankly, that we need that to be 99.86 or 9.6. Okay. You can get that done in Fisher Tropes. It's very difficult to do with trans. <coughs> Uh, then there are acts of God, you know, maybe the farm crop goes out one, one year. Uh, farm is good this year, it looks like. I mean, even with the heat waves and the storms, it seems like the farm crops, most of the stuff we're talking about, seem like they're doing really well. But, you know, uh, climate change, you never know. And corn might be wiped out in one year. Okay. So, <clears throat> these are not in particular order of their actual usage. And I, I say top five, but I've, I've actually put in six. Um, but one of them really is a story. And I think it's the, one of the things that really has gotten us adopted uh, by NBB, which got us equalized with a tax credit, which got us um, everything else. And so I'll talk about UCO, not from what it's going to be contributing, not from the work that we can do with you know, recovering the six billion gallons of trap grease that <laughs> are generated, which really is a combination of a bunch of things, moisture, sulfur, <laughs> a bunch of other things in there. Uh, but that story is a beautiful story, right? Being able to recycle, that's a great story, okay? But we know that there are issues with, <coughs> all with that story. We all can make $25 bodies very easily with the UCO story. I still think that soy virgin is going to be top. Um, I think that we hear a lot about DGG corn. Uh, that's uh, distilled grain corn from ethanol plants. I think it's going to be, a, it's a great source, it's a great specific source. Um, I'm not sure it's going to be the number one source, I don't think so. I think we're going to see a lot more POM and POM derivatives. We're seeing fuel pathways for POM. Uh, that includes PFAD derivatives, POM fatty acid derivatives. The issue with these products here and here, issue here is a pretreatment issue. Okay. Issue here is a both a pretreatment and post-treatment issue. These are very, very lossy products. And so the pushback points to actually manufacturing palm uh, and palm derivatives can be very close. Right now, soy oil, a virgin, is hovering between 42 and 48 cents. Okay? The old pushback number without there being a subsidy in place is about 54 cents a pound. That's when you start looking at other stuff to make your bio out of. Okay? But the reality is that I suspect that uh, this is still going to be the dominant guy. It doesn't mean that it's actually the preferred guy from a fuel perspective. Because again, you still get short chains out of this stuff. And so that doesn't mean it's the best actual fuel. But it's easily blended, it's easily made consistent. We've got the most production experience in that area. And it's trans friendly. Absolutely trans friendly. You don't need to take this stuff and do official tropes with it. That would make no sense. Okay. Um, animal fats and tile derivatives. A lot of fish and tropes, that makes perfect sense. All right. So, um, DVG corn can be fish or tropes, 
get rid of your pretreatment issue, but also, quite frankly, uh, you can do it via trans as well. But you've got some post, um, some, some pretreatment steps to do beforehand. And canola, I think, is really going to be popular. Canola seems like everybody's wanting to put the canola in. You're testing it as an error mid crop. It seems like that might actually be a pretty good crop. So I'll stand behind my, my estimates. Do, do you see municipal solid waste as being, uh, I don't know, number seven or? No, no, I, this five. is not really in order. I, I don't think so. I, I don't think that we can actually produce numbers that will move significant decimal points out of those products. But I think that from the story perspective, and from you, this is what I have at McDonald's, right? You can have a McDonald's that generates a, a million bucks a year in revenues, you can still live okay. You're not the biggest guy, right? You're not corporate McDonald's with you know, the 500 stores in, in the same area. It's just you've got a nice, viable business making high quality products and selling that to your, your markets. That's it. But as it moves a decimal point up or down on, on whether or not it's the, uh, the number one product, no. I think this product has a favorable CI value. I think actually both of these actually have favorable CI values, but you see a recycled brown grease, for example, will have the most favorable values. Okay, see, so you're saying that those aren't in order, they're just what you see as what has future for the next 10 or so years. That's right. And uh, have you, have you, do you think that municipal solid waste would play into that, though? It, it seems like that's something that's rising up, especially with the Bishop Tropes conversation. No, I think so. In fact, I mean, we've been working on interesting technologies or microbial technologies to you know, keep the ground <coughs> grease, the trap grease, from converting to trap grease and sort of keep them the, you know, the solid leg. I mean, that is a, it's a viable option. That's the option that's going to grow. So again, it's the best story. It is by far the best story. Virgin is not as favorable story to me as telling somebody, we're recycling your stuff. It's getting a second use, and we're doing special stuff with it. That story is just so powerful that it's, it's the right story to tell. Okay, Todd, uh, one thing that's always interesting to think about when, you're, when everybody's thinking top five, top ten lists and such is where are, you, where are you putting the fences around this? Is this US? Is this North America? Ah, oh, thank is you very much. I'm, again, this is actually very interesting. I'm thinking US, mm -hmm. even though the fuel pathways, this is the product is being sourced from outside the country. Right? We're obviously not the biggest pond growers. Right? <laughs> so, so that fuel pathway is being built to allow for the import of these products. Okay. Um, soy, we make a lot of soy. That's our stuff. That's our domain. Right? You're not going to get a better CI value for soy out of some other foreign country. Palm, absolutely. Uh, maybe canola. I can see that. Mexico, those guys. Yes. Uh, did you consider camelina in that? I did, but the reality is that Camelina actually makes some really cool higher end products. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, where Camelina, you really can get that into Dow Corning and stuff like that. There's certain kinds of things that will basically, from a ratio perspective, they make good chain links. Yeah, penny crest. Yeah. Penny crest, again, good chain link kinds of stuff. And so when you're looking at that kind of stuff, I feel like you can actually see, one, better, better margins selling at the higher end markets. Okay. But then the second thing is just the impact of, of how much is being grown versus what's being diverted. I don't, I don't see those as really, I don't see those as supers, but that's, this is my opinion, right? Time's going to tell. Okay. That's my actual uh, core presentation, and I can take questions for the next 30 minutes about anything like It says you go out here, Malia, I'm a grower, I grow on the crush. I wondered what you thought of the Camelina and the metal oxide catalyst. It's kind of the way I'm looking to bench here. I think that metal oxide catalyst is a, I think it's a great, it's a good technology. We've been really looking at metal oxide catalyst. We, our, our processing approach is slightly different in the first place. Um, but I do believe, quite frankly, that metal oxide gets you really good, good results with an acid pretreatment on the front. Have you ever heard of the McGuyan guys up there in Minnesota? No, I haven't. McGuyan? Yeah, I have. I'm working with those guys up there. That's probably where we have them after this. Did, yeah, you, did you sign their non disclosure yeah, agreement or did you modify their non disclosure agreement before you go out and travel Yeah, seriously, the, 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 the tech is not, quite frankly, it's, it's really um, hard to tune but easy to build, just like your body's a plant. 
your standard Eclipse plan. So you don't need to sign any uh, thing where you're going to get in trouble or, or have some non-compete. The, the technology has, has been it's well out there. It's not like it's uh, you know, it's well out there. Um, We're talking about fixed oxide catalysts. Yes, that, like calcium oxide. Yeah. Or, yeah. And it, are there commercial units? Do you know of commercial units that are operational using the fixed oxide? I I know of a couple guys who sold units. Uh, I think New Leaf is using a unit that they bought. I think that they changed out from metal oxide because they had some thing where they actually <coughs> buy the oxide directly from the company in canisters, and that was a problem for them. But uh, reality is, you don't need to do all that. It's really very straightforward. Uh, commercial units, no. You are going to be dealing with some higher temperatures and some um, higher pressure form factors. So you need to make sure that uh, from your local fire department's perspective, they're going to be happy with that. Um, the good part of it is, is that you know the, the metal oxide catalysts are, are completely regenerable for a long period of time. Uh, you can basically you know, burn off and carbonize any contaminants on them. They work very well. We've been doing a lot of stuff. We're just actually building recirculation units for metal oxide catalysts. You just pack it. You treat it as a structured pack and use it as a flow. And just recirculate the metal oxide catalyst. The higher temperature, of course, and higher pressure. And do you need a low FFA oil to, to go through that? Oh, that's the, beauty, that's the beauty of that, that approach, is that you can actually use higher FFAs, 1215. Now, again, these are side effects. It's, it's what your cost is and how much you're willing to lose. Right? You can use POM, but you're going to lose 20% of your product. Right? Pretty consistent. So it's not hysterifying the FFAs. No, and in fact, it's not even it's not even a matter of. Uh, it's funny. There's like a molecular memory that happens, and this might a chemist might be able to explain better than physicists, quite frankly. But you know, it's sort of like baking grease. It's solid room temperature. There's a fraction of the product that. That's why we have cold soap issues. That sort of remembers. That sort of operates the same way whether or not the um, uh, glycol group has been cut off or not. It's the same. So it, you know, you cool it down, it congeals. That's pretty much it. And uh, so the palm with uh, acid formations uh, and the other sort of chain groups in there, you're going to lose a lot of product there. So you have to be very careful. And I, and I mean, this is, you know, this could cost you a couple hundred grand, <coughs> speaking from experience. The, uh, you have to be very careful when you do those products to make sure that you understand what the loss yield is going to be. Because there's going to be loss. Just like in UCO. But sometimes you have better results in UCO because Cherry pitch your customers. You got customers that are predominantly in soy. You might have canola mix in there. You might have you might have some palm in there. Palm being used for bakery, baking more and more now. But um, you know, answer your questions. Or? Yeah. Have you done life cycle assessment on these feedstocks to determine which one of these feedstocks would have like the least environmental impact? Huh. That's interesting. Not exactly because that's actually being done as people put in new fuel pathways and they're made public. So that's the good thing about the fuel pathways. The fuel pathways have to be published and made public. It doesn't mean you can always use a fuel pathway because some guys have contracts with the provider, for example. So they're providing their own data. The issue is the numbers are always sort of, at some point, arbitrary. Right? There's some level of um, guesstimation. Uh, the formula is sort of an arbitrary mix of stuff. And so refining that formula over time is really what the, what the issue is going to be. Most of the stuff that we've been doing internally in our plant is making sure that our energy utilization, our, our energy balance is coming out in a way that makes sense. Right? Because again, we're putting a lot of energy in the product. Right? So we want to make sure that that makes sense and it's, it's cost effective for us. And our mandate at Promethean is that basically everything we make uh, must have some sort of environmental benefit. Doesn't mean that it's it's uh, more friendly in the environment when it's done. So, for example, uh, I need to make something that that is either more friendly in its production or more friendly when it's out in the environment. But I'm not trying to say that you know benzene is a bad chemical. It's not. In fact, it's a very cool chemical. Maybe our application utilization isn't. Maybe we're not careful enough with it as humans. But nature has crafted this stuff over millions of years. And so, from my perspective. It's not the petroleum that's bad. It's the way we manufacture it, the way we use it, the way we don't take care of its use. You're, you're talking production pathways. Can you be precise about what that means? Uh, it's not okay. So, so um, there are a couple things. Uh, so I was talking about uh, fuel pathways, the first thing. But then the production pathway is uh, we have a system that really is 
five or six different systems. And we determine in the middle of the batch what the next step is. Okay? So most plants aren't built that way. Most plants are built so that they put the product in one end, it comes out the other end. Okay? And so they're trying to normalize chaos on the front end. That's why you see a lot of esterification, a lot of other kinds of things to try to normalize specification. That DGG guy is going to stick to DGG. He's not going to try to do other stuff outside of that bailiwick. The tallow guy is doing tallow stuff. He's not doing stuff outside of that bailiwick, right? Because otherwise, he's got to niche his process. So basically, you're, you're, it's problematic because each step proceeds, you decide what the next step is. That's right. But each step has an energy cost. You know, if we decide to take something through a water wash, which is doing it through simply a resin. Um, that has a different cost profile perspective. It's a different environmental aspect. So we're looking at all those things to try to understand how other plants uh, would perform against us in the future. We're trying to say, we're trying to come up with a model whereby a smaller plant actually is more efficient from an energy utilization perspective. Right? It's just not as well funded. And then there's fuel pathways. The fuel pathways are basically uh, registration, um, the two types, the EPA registration, which is, uh, hey, we're going to take this feedstock and we want RFS credits for it, okay? Can we get them? And they ask you a series of questions, you respond, and they say, hey, this is qualifying, maybe you'll get 1.1 credit, maybe you'll get 1.5 credits, but whatever. Um, LCFS is very similar, except that they're actually adding a couple of different factors to it, including uh, transportation from out of state like that because again it's, it's a state specific mandate but again almost almost carbon copy from uh, RFS that, that's how they really started they cut it pasted it from RFS so as you go through your production uh, um, pathways are you finding that you're at you have each iteration that you're getting more and more efficient with like uh, like a like a, a put in one end take out another end production well that's interesting the efficiency comes from the fact that you know we we can we convert these things into standard operating procedures. So the, the efficiency is coming from the fact that we've done, you know, thousands of batches now. Uh, not quite frankly, ten thousand, tens of thousands of batches now. And so we have actually all of that history. So we can say, hey, this is what the profile was of, of the product now. What's the next step? And that could be pump out, and the guy can basically take a page and follow the steps. And again, that was one way I was really trying to lower the cost, the total cost of ownership of the plant, the labor cost, the training cost, right? Uh, and of course, we're dealing with a varied amount of products. There's sometimes we'll, we'll, we're handling peanut oil, great stuff. Right? Sometimes we're handling, again, the dirtiest of the dirty uh, UCO. And so from that perspective, it helps us, it behooves us to understand how those things break out differently. You know? um, invariably, if we do virgin soy, you know, that stuff breaks so nicely that you know you've got maybe a hundred parts per million soap if you let it sit overnight. No water washing required, so it's the filter press. And, you know, treat it for cold. Uh, you do the same with uh, yeah, you do the same with UCO, and you're you're going to come out with between three hundred and sixty thousand parts per million soap, and so you got to figure out what you're going to do to get that product in, and so it's that kind of stuff. And um, quite frankly, it was funny because last year, uh, Dr. Van Gerpen was talking about looking at reaction kinetics for UCL. And uh, well, reaction kinetics in general for, for transesterification. Uh, and I'm thinking that UCO is really a challenge because quite frankly, you've got an unknown mix. You can come up with some kind of limit based on what you theoretically think is the, the constituents are. But the reality is that coming with reaction kinetics for all those is a, that's a different, that's a different puzzle. So, you're, I, is the, uh, the sort of the global point that you're making is that you're trying to leverage your plant to be flexible with whatever feedstocks you deal with and run your process in a lot of different ways depending on what kinds of feedstock you get. If you end up with an oil that you just don't think you can transesterify, then you might try to gasify it with the Fisher Tropes type process or you might take in some other kinds of feedstocks that are not even oil-based for fisher Well, that wasn't, my, that wasn't my global point, because we don't do fisher tropes uh, better than that. We don't do fisher tropes in my plant. 
But I have to say that um, the whole guideline was that if you're picking a technology and you're picking a market right now, that you need to take some of these things into account. The technology you pick in the market. If you've got the government in your business plan as, as your number one you know, uh, customer, then you need to understand that maybe you need to understand where fatty at massive metal investors have a home in government business. Maybe that's a USDA kind of product and not a uh, fuel product from that perspective for the military. So if you want to play in that space, you probably are best served by playing fish and troops. Or metal oxide cows, something where you can really get very, very high consistency out of that. But again, that's higher temperatures, that's it's fundamentally different than what we're doing. And the permitting process for that, at least in California, is a whole different cycle. Uh, I'll take you, sir, and then okay. Oh, you go first, sir. Well, you mentioned uh, <coughs> algae is probably not a good future source for making the biodiesel. <coughs> Do you have some citations or anything on, on Well, just because you can make bodies a lot of it doesn't mean it's going to be good to make it out of it. Just <laughs> I couldn't hear the last part. I don't have citations for that. I'll cite myself. I, oh. Just because you can make bodies a lot of it, it's sort of like, um, um, I, I've got a thought. Yeah. Go. So yeah. if you're using, if you can uh, successfully use algae to make biodiesel, uh, that's great, but the work that you put into that might be a good portion of the work that you would put into also making an omega-3 fatty acid dietary supplement. So you're saying it's worth more as a fatty yeah. acid yeah, yeah, exactly. right, a dietary more. supplement. Yes. Yeah. So, so yeah, a lot, um, some of the labs who are doing this right now are moving into those much higher nutraceutical value products. So $4 a gallon for fuel pales in comparison to $10 for three ounces of um, that's what they're making. Okay. Um, Artemisinin. it. So you can make something that is way more value dense. And as long as you're working on developing an algae growth path and adjusting the uh, genetics and adjusting the biology and all of those aspects of algae growth, you can point it in any direction you want. And pointing it towards making oil, which becomes fuel, $4 a gallon, we think, Americans, for some reason, think that's expensive. That's crazy cheap compared to the rest, of the rest of the world for fuel and particularly other really high value density products. Yeah. So people are going that direction first. You mentioned short chain lengths and that made me wonder, uh, you know, is there, I mean, different algaes produce different things. I was just wondering. That's correct. I mean, and again, I, and also we're talking about you know, 10 years to the, to the next technology. So I'm, I'm, I'm living my time frame. Because they're again, doing things right now that drastically improve the output of, of algae for oil. No, I, I again, so, my issue is not whether or not algae is a viable source, future source for oil. I'm, I'm sure they can even GMO uh, some source of algae. I think Mr. Music would talk better about that than I can. But quite frankly, I think that. Uh, what? <laughs> Dr. Music. I'm sorry, doctor. <laughs> but at any rate, my, my, my suspicion is that by the time the research is done, it's, it's, you will have found so many other higher end uses for it that that, that stuff is not really going to be the stuff that we're making. Of. Talked a lot about customizing your products to make make them viable in the marketplace. Right. What about customizing your market to meet the meet the conditions or the capacity of your product? Well, it's interesting. I think that in, in certain areas, I mean, Breckenridge is a prime example exactly. uh, where Kumar operates in Yokeo. That's a perfect example as well in Northern California, where folks would you know pay a dollar more at times uh, for, for bio. So again, I think it's possible to build niche businesses that feed your family, pay for your kids' education, and, and, and pay for your people living wages. That's why we're trying to do this experiment as a co-op. But the reality is that uh, those are niche markets. Um, people live in niches all their lives. It's not a bad thing. Okay? But just understand that you're playing in that space and you have to build that space very specifically. Is it viable? Yes. Uh, can you scale it to unlimited stuff? I doubt it because it's a niche market. So by definition, it's hard to scale. And, and then it's, you're going to be the one that's financing paving the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and as we know, it's not always good to arrive first. So the uh, <laughs> sometimes second is the best position, right? And uh, <laughs> you've seen that time and time again. I was just going to say, like, 
I am in a niche market. This is my market here. And, you know, we've we got about 300 grease collection accounts. And now I've got about 40 of those that are on our full program that are using our glycerin-based cleaner and our hand soaps. So we've been able to look at, okay, instead of tripling the amount of accounts that I collect oil from, it all supports the same loop. Uh, and we're able now to integrate more value into each account. And also finding that people that are into this, they're like, give me more, give me more, give me more. I want to do it all. You know, and if you can only offer one thing to them, maybe you can offer six or seven. You know, we're, we're a delivery company now too. I drop an invoice off when I go to a restaurant. Something I've never done. And they're writing me checks, not for grease, but for their grease to come back <laughs> to them. So, you know, that's still something that we're getting going. And that's just this year, but as far as like growing, you know, customizing your market, you know, who knows, the, the whole food thing now, the whole local food thing, it's a big talk. Yeah. It's a lot more complicated than just saying, oh, we'll just deliver food too. <laughs> but we're getting a full truck leaving our shop and we're getting a full truck coming back. And I'm really excited about it. So hopefully next year I get to share with you guys exactly how we did it. So I just wanted to pull up here. It's sort of loading a little bit slowly. I'm not quite sure why. Just there will be stuff. But you'll see here we have a variety of products that we're offering as well to different markets, um, including other fuel producers. And we have different grades of, of fatty acid methyl esters. Right? And uh, we have stuff that we call fuel grade. The reality is that um, our biodiesel is actually slightly lower quality than our uh, vegetable methyl ester gold from a conversion perspective. Um, but again, fuel is fuel. It does what it's supposed to do. It's within its spec. Quality is sort of within the eye of the beholder, right? But I definitely wouldn't sell this to the same market. Okay. Um, we have another one. I'm sorry, this isn't loading. So I'll try to reload it one more time. So, um, you'll see that we've got brown grease products. We had our recycled margarine. Uh, we still have a little bit left in that. Um, what can that go in? Most of that actually goes to guys who are either making makeup or feed. Okay. Um, and uh, it actually, the emulsifier has been removed, but that's, again, a palm distillate. Now, we could separate that out um, into two phases. Um, so you'd see that there would be a really a loose oleic up the top and, and a thicker oleic at the bottom. And this is actually the issue with palm is that, again, you've got this stuff that basically you're going to lose a lot of it. It'll be ester, right? It's been trans or sterified, but it's not, again, liquid at room temperature. But it has its other applications. Okay. Um, so, but as you find these niches, well, then you've got all these byproducts. And then is the byproduct worth enough for you to try to market that byproduct? Right? Are you making enough of it to have a market for it, or is it really just a problem for you? Right. So that's what we look at too, quite frankly, is, okay, we've got this stuff, uh, we made a bunch of uh, uh, methyl esters from this stuff, well, I didn't show you the loss percentage, Dara's seen it, right? This thick, coagulated ester at the bottom. What do you do with that stuff? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So you can create your own problems too, because and as you go in, in California, everything we have has to be labeled. And if we don't say it's you know in process or it's not recycled, or you know, it's, we can say it's not has, but there's a point in time where we have to figure out how to get rid of it because we have limits on how much product we can have inside our facility. So if we're create, trying to create markets with our byproducts. It's tight for us to do so. It's a small, it's a small shop. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, <coughs> Brown grease again, a lot of that, uh, a lot of crude glycerin going out, uh, demethylated. Uh, also, we actually take a lot of it and, and you know, strip the FFA out of it too. Um, and then, so I mean, that's what you start to sort of see in our realm of the world. Uh, Dar's realm is, is different. Um, I'm expecting that every other realm would be slightly different, slightly different mix. <coughs> One last thing though, on being in the biodiesel market. We tend to look at the retail price of biodiesel when we do our business plans. 
But understand, the financing model for bio is different. So when you sell biodiesel, it'll leave your shop at you know, some index rate of heating oil, maybe between $2.35 a day and $2.65 a day. So you're waiting for the rest of your money. It'll get there, they say. I'm still waiting after two years for my tax credit money. <coughs> so if I relied on those tax credits and I tried to focus just on the biodiesel market, I'd be out of business all the perspective, future plants would be far more dedicated. Now, one of the things that I did with this plant was it, on purpose, was R&D oriented. 20% of our expenditures are for R&D. So as a, that's not a profit center, and that's not the kind of profitable company you're talking about, which is one of the reasons we're cooperative. But building a new plant, we're taking the knowledge base that we've had over the last six years of operating. And yes, we are picking the technology for the next plant. And that would probably be a metal oxide catalyst plant. Because the Fisher Tropes plant, you know, there's some other <coughs> issues with the, the danger of operating these plants. Right? I don't want to be responsible for uh, Exxon kinds of bombs. <laughs> it's already hard enough to sleep at night worrying about rag fires. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so you're saying Fisher Tropes, you don't just need gas to live with technology. To I'm talking about all the various thermal hydrogenation techs. Absolutely. I'm not, I'm not just talking about the same gas. Yeah. yeah, I know. I'm just trying to keep it general. And Renewable diesel. Uh, Renewable diesel. All those things that make basically analogs, where you'd have to theoretically try to carbon date them to, to determine what the difference was between that and the petroleum product. Absolutely. And again, the, I'm not being biased here. The, I don't think petroleum is a bad product. I think that the way we use it has led to some consequences that are great for us. <coughs> 